The digestive system is covered in chapter six of your textbook. And we'll start with just an overview of the digestive system, including the digestive tract. Um, the entire system consists of the digestive tract as well as some accessory organs that help with food breakdown and nutrient absorption. Um, we'll go through the parts of the digestive tract, starting with the mouth. This is where digestion begins. Um, within the mouth, you have the salivary glands, which secrete saliva um, that contains digestive enzymes to help with the breakdown of food. Also, teeth are found within the mouth. These perform mastication, which means chewing, and this involves the physical breakdown of food. Teeth are located in sockets within the gingiva. The tongue assists in chewing by moving food around in the mouth. It also helps with deglutition, which is the term for swallowing. The tongue is covered with small bumps called papilla, and these contain the taste buds. The hard palate is located in the anterior part of the roof of the mouth, and it's made of bone. The soft palate it forms the posterior portion of the roof of the mouth, and it is composed of muscle tissue. Within the mouth, food is formed into a bolus, which is a solid ball of food mixed with saliva. From the mouth, food enters the, um, I'm sorry, the pharynx, which is the upper throat. Um, and this is not only a passageway for air, which we talked about earlier, but it's also a passageway um, for food until it reaches the esophagus. The epiglottis, remember, is part of the larynx, and it's a piece of cartilage that covers the trachea during swallowing to ensure that the bolus moves into the esophagus, which is this muscular tube shown here that carries food into the stomach. The stomach is a muscular sac that stores food, and here mechanical and chemical digestion occur. There's a few parts to the stomach. The fundus is the upper portion. The body is the large central portion. And the pylorus is the lower portion. There are two sphincters um, that control the entrance and the exit of the stomach. The lower esophageal sphincter is where the esophagus meets the stomach. And this prevents food from regurgitating back up into the esophagus. The pyloric sphincter is down at this end. This is where the stomach meets the small intestine. The term peristalsis means coordinated muscle contractions that push food forward through the entire GI tract. Um, so this is occurring within the stomach. And by the time food exits the stomach, it's called chyme. It's no longer a bolus, but now it's liquefied because it's been mixed with digestive enzymes and gastric juice. The small intestine is, is coiled up. It's about 20 feet long and it's coiled so that it can actually fit in the abdominal cavity. It consists of three parts. The duodenum is shown in light blue. That's the first about 10 inches or so. Then the next section here <coughs> is called the jejunum. That's the middle 10 feet. And then the last 12 feet is called the ileum. The small intestine contains villi, which are microscopic finger-like projections that help with absorption. They help absorb nutrients. Uh, a lot of chemical digestion happens here due to the secretions from the pancreas and the liver. The ileocecal valve connects the small intestine to the large intestine, which is the last portion of the GI tract. It is shown right here. It's about five feet long and it frames the small intestine. So the small intestine will be located right here in the middle. The cecum is the first several inches. The appendix is a finger-like projection that hangs off of the cecum. And then the colon is the rest of the large intestine. The rectum is the final about eight inches or so of the large intestine. So that's the GI tract, but there are also some accessory organs that contribute to digestion. The liver is the largest of these. It's actually the largest internal organ. 
Um, it's located in the upper right quadrant of the body. It produces bile, um, which helps to break down and digest fat. The gallbladder is this green structure right here, a sac-like structure located under the right lobe of the liver. It stores bile after it's been produced by the liver, and then it secretes that bile when it is needed for digestion. And the other one shown here in a yellowish color is the pancreas. It's actually located behind the stomach. So the stomach is not pictured here, otherwise it would be blocking the pancreas almost completely. This secretes enzymes and hormones. Um, it produces all of the digestive enzymes that get secreted and do their job in the small intestine. So next in the, the PowerPoint and in your outline are some combining forms related to the, the digestive system, also prefixes and suffixes. So next is some pathology related to this body system. Um, an ulcer is an open sore on the skin or on mucous membranes of the body, and it's named based on the location. So peptic ulcers develop in the digestive tract. Most frequently they're found in the stomach or the esophagus, usually due to excessive acid in the stomach. A hernia is the protrusion of a structure through the wall of the cavity in which it is contained. Next is hepatitis. Remember, itis means inflammation. This is chronic inflammation of the liver. And um, one very typical sign of hepatitis is jaundice, where an individual um, starts having bilirubin, uh, which is normally a component of bile. It starts building up in the liver and ultimately spreads to other areas of the body. So it is seen in the skin, the mucous membranes. It um, You'll see like a yellow coloration of the skin, mucous membranes, also sometimes the whites of the eyes. Um, the next one is diverticulosis. This is where small pockets develop in the lining of the large intestine. And if these become inflamed, it's then called diverticulitis. All right, a couple um, forms of cancer. Colorectal cancer typically originates in the lining of the colon or the rectum. Uh, it's unfortunately very common in the United States. And stomach cancer originates in the lining of the stomach. And this actually is not quite as common in the U.S., but if, um, if you get it, it does have a high mortality rate, unfortunately. Um, some other diseases and conditions. Anorexia means loss of appetite. Appendicitis, again, the itis ending, means inflammation of the appendix. Ascites is excess fluid um, in the abdominal cavity, and quite often this results from some sort of liver disease. Cirrhosis is scarring of liver tissue. You can see what it looks like here, scar tissue built up on the outside. This results in decreased liver function. Often it's due to liver disease as well. Colic is a spasm in any hollow, soft organ. Crohn's disease is a form of inflammatory bowel disease that can cause fever, cramping, and diarrhea. Flatus is gas production in the GI tract, and that causes air to be expelled from uh, through the rectum. Gastroesophageal reflux disease. This is the backflow of the stomach contents into the esophagus due to a malfunction of the lower esophageal sphincter. Hematemesis is the vomiting of blood. Hemorrhoids is the enlargement of veins in the anal canal. Often that's caused by increased abdominal pressure. Irritable bowel syndrome, or IBS, is painful spastic colon, which often leads to altered bowel function. And, in, and most often, the cause of this is unknown. Melena is dark, almost black feces, 
due to the presence of blood. This is caused by bleeding um, in the upper digestive tract, so bleeding in the esophagus or the stomach. Obesity is excessive fat accumulation, um, and if someone is morbidly obese, they have, um, they're about 40% above the average body weight. Just normal obesity is about 20% above average body weight. Regurgitation means backward flow. Often this, mean, this is referring to the, uh, the backward flow of food from the stomach into the mouth. Ulcerative colitis is a chronic inflammatory disease of the colon. The lining of the colon is affected and often it develops bleeding ulcers and can be very painful. Um, so diagnostic tests include gastrointestinal endoscopy. This is the visual examination of the GI tract. And then some lab tests that can be run. A hepatitis panel involves blood tests to determine the virus, the specific virus that is causing hepatitis. There's, there are different forms of hepatitis caused by different types of viruses. Liver function tests are blood tests to evaluate liver function. And this will help with the diagnosis of a liver disease. A stool culture is a test to identify the microorganisms in feces that could be causing a GI infection. And a stool guaiac is a test where a substance is applied to stool to detect the presence of blood. Um, so as far as imaging goes, just two that I'll talk about quickly. An upper GI series involves x-rays of the upper GI organs, like the esophagus, stomach, and small intestine. The lower GI series involves x-rays of the rectum and the colon. And then um, finally, some medical and surgical procedures to treat these conditions that we've discussed so far. An appendectomy is the surgical removal of a diseased appendix. So that's, this is often what will result if you have appendicitis. Nasogastric intubation is when a tube is inserted through the nose um, to get into the stomach that, that's shown here. And this is used to relieve excess gas or to deliver medication, food, or fluids to the stomach. Bariatric surgery involves procedures used to treat obesity. There's different types Gastric bypass decreases the stomach size and a band, like if you've heard of the lap band, this restricts food consumption. And then finally, a colostomy is a surgical procedure where an opening is formed from the colon to the exterior of the body. And a couple different types of medications. Antacids neutralize acidity, usually in the stomach. Um, so if you're suffering from excess acid being secreted in the stomach, this can help. Antiemetics help control nausea and vomiting. And then laxatives are used to treat constipation by increasing the motility of the GI tract.